Good morning. It is so good to see humans here this week. Wow, that was a, that was bizarre last week. It was like a ghost town. So glad everyone, most everyone, all of our families are back. I know some are still traveling, and everyone is alive and very well this week. So that is wonderful. We will be in uh, John chapter ten. If you were, if you missed the ending of John chapter nine, I'll try to summarize it pretty quickly for you. Uh, John chapter nine. We had the man born blind. Uh, the disciples walked by and asked Jesus who sinned, this man or his parents, only giving Jesus two options. Jesus chooses another option and says the man is born blind for the glory of God. And uh, we spent some time looking at that and looking at suffering and the sovereignty of God. Spent a lot of time on that a couple of weeks ago. And then as that uh, progressed last week, we looked at how Jesus presents himself as the light of the world, uh, brings healing to the man but also brings spiritual healing to the man and truly reveals himself to be the light of the world. The man uh, born blind goes from not seeing to seeing and then acknowledges that Jesus is a, a man. Uh, then he acknowledges that Jesus is a righteous man and must be because God listens to him. Then as he's interviewed by the Pharisees, he says that Jesus is a prophet because in the Old Testament, only prophets bring supernatural healings, signs like this. Uh, Pharisees are getting angrier and angrier at him for siding with Jesus, that he is saying that he is righteous, that he is a prophet. And then when Jesus finally seeks him out, because the Pharisees, and we'll get into this a lot today, the supposed shepherds of the flock of Israel cast him out, excommunicated him from their religion, uh, kicked him out kick this sheep out of the fold, and what does Jesus do? The great shepherd of the souls, he goes to him. He seeks those who are hurt, seeks those who are lost, and, and calls him to himself. And at the end of chapter 9, we see that uh, the blind man, man formerly bl born blind, uh, believes in Jesus for salvation. He sees him as the son of man, going, pulling back from Daniel seven fourteen, that he is the one, the son of man, that he is Lord and God and bows down and worships him. Then at the end of chapter 9, John gives us a quick summary there of the Pharisees who remain in blindness. And with all this before them, they still remain blind. All right, and that will carry us into John chapter 10 today. Let's look at verses 1 and we'll go through verse 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers." This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word to feed on today. Uh, we acknowledge that you are the great shepherd of our souls, Lord, the shepherd of our lives. We acknowledge that you are sovereign over all things and you direct our path, Lord. Help us to honor you in all that we do. Uh, help us to see what is here before us today as Jesus claims to be and professes to be the great shepherd that was announced in the Old Testament and that he is the door, that he is exclusively the only way to heaven, and there is no other. And help us to see him rightly as the man born blind did, that Jesus is indeed the Son of Man, that he is also God, that he is Lord, and that we should worship him. We, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, so John chapter 10, as we just kind of surveyed John chapter 9, flows together really, really well. Because in John chapter 9, you basically have Jesus, the great shepherd of, the, of our souls, the great shepherd of the Old Testament. We'll get more into that today, next week, and in your discipleship time today, who is going after one of his sheep, 
whom the shepherds of Israel have mistreated. And this is all prophetic. And if we go back into the Old Testament, there's many, many places where God is regarded as the shepherd. But also, we're going to look to, for quite a bit of this sermon, go back to find Ezekiel and go to the chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 4 is one of the most extensive comparisons to the shepherds of Israel and to the great shepherd of Israel. And it is also prophetic that all this is going to be happening around the time when the Messiah comes and the new covenant is made. So Ezekiel is obviously a prophet. Uh, Ezekiel 34 is prophetic. It is talking about what is coming in the future. And everything that is happening in John 10 is basically what is happening in Ezekiel 34 has been prophesied about. The animosity between the shepherds of Israel and the shepherd of Israel, God, is all foretold and it's all laid out here. And that God is going to see the shepherds, their abuse of the sheep, and how they are, uh, they are destroying the sheep. And he is going to raise up his own shepherd to shepherd his flock. So we're going to look at that today. So today, most likely, we'll spend more time in Ezekiel 34 than in John 10. But I think it lays a great groundwork as we go through John 10. You're getting to see the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, but yet seeing these prophecies and how they play out. So let's, let's kind of take this uh, little by little, Ezekiel 34. Let's look at verses 1 through 6. It says, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. All right, very important. We see that here from the beginning that this prophet uh, has a message from God and he is speaking against the shepherds of Israel. Those would be the Pharisees, the, Sa the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin of the day. He goes on, prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, all shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled over them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains. And on every hill, my sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. All right, we'll pause just a moment here. Uh, we will see that the Old Testament and New Testament is full of comparisons and, uh, and metaphors, analogies, comparing uh, uh, agricultural things, harvest, or even sheep herding, to spiritual things, and it was extremely common. Even if you look back at, uh, at, at herding and, and sheep herding, uh, who, who the, of the patriarchs, the Old Testament characters, you think back, Abraham, right, well, uh, participated in this. Uh, if you keep going, you have Jacob that also participated as a, as a shepherd. You have uh, Moses, who was also a shepherd as well, and you have this is extremely common. And even if you weren't directly involved in it, you are very aware of it because it was usually being done around you somewhere. So here, God himself is saying that the shepherds, and the analogy is a shepherd is a nurturer, a carer. He has the best interests of the sheep in mind. He has to care for them, lead them to green pastures, protect them, nurture them. If one is sick, if one is ill, he is, becomes the doctor taking care of that sheep. If one is lost, he goes and gets it, etc. And here you have them... Uh, neglecting all of their duties. And it's not physical. Again, you've got to make that spiritual comparison, right? But here, these shepherds of Israel, they're not caring for the flock of Jesus Christ. They're not doing anything that they're supposed to be doing. They've neglected all of their responsibilities, and they're only caring about themselves. Selfish gain is it, all right? Uh, now, this is we see that this is happening prophetically. It's coming at a future time. How do we know that it's happening in the future? Because here in just a moment, we're going to get to this at the end uh, as we progress. But all this is happening right before uh, God sends his great shepherd. He sends the Messiah to care for the flock. In Ezekiel 36, we have the new covenant announced that the new that the Messiah is going to make. 
so we see that all this is happening is building up. So keep this in mind as we're go getting into John chapter 10. Uh, keep on going. Look at Ezekiel 34, 7 through 10. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd. And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. Uh, I will rescue my sheep from their mouths and they may not be food for them. So here we see this great tension, right, between the shepherds and between God himself. You have shepherds who are, who are imposters supposedly feeding the sheep. They are not feeding the sheep at all. Uh, they're doing no such thing. So God, in that last portion of verse 10, says that he is going to rescue his sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. So here you have the great shepherds supposedly feeding the sheep who are doing the opposite of that. Not only are they not caring for them, but they're devouring them. They're destroying the, the, the sheep. So God says that he is going to step in. He is going to be their shepherd. Now, this, uh, this tension we catch a lot as we go through the book of John between the Jewish leaders, the supposed shepherds, right, and the shepherd that God has sent, God in the flesh. Uh, recall, turn back, hold your spot there in Ezekiel, but uh, John 8, 44, we find where the, the Pharisees were claiming that Jesus had been a false teacher. They claimed also later that he was a Samaritan, that, that, that would be a false teacher as well. They claimed that he had a demon as well. And yet you have God in the flesh who is calling out the shepherds of that day, the Jewish leaders, and look what he says to them in 844. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So this is what we find in Je uh, the time Jesus has come. The supposed leaders of Israel, the shepherds that are supposedly feeding the flock, are actually working for the enemy. They claim to be children of Abraham. They claimed God as their father, and yet you have God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, saying, No, God is not your father. Abraham is not your father. Your father is Satan. And this is huge because they boasted and bragged that they were genetically of the line of Abraham. They sat in the seat of Moses, right? They judged everyone, but yet God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, says they are of the devil. So this is what we're finding over here in Ezekiel. The shepherds that he is prophesying about are not feeding the sheep, not caring for the sheep. They're devouring the sheep. They're only after their own self-interest. Now, let's progress. Go back to Ezekiel 34. Look at verse 11 through 16. And this, this, this metaphor continues on here, this comparison. Verse 11, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on my mountains of Israel by my ravens and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There, shall, uh, there they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Wow. So these, these are the words that are against the shepherds. And notice as you go through this, who gets the credit for the rescue of the sheep? 
for the gathering of the sheep, for seeking the sheep, right? For the healing of the sheep, for the feeding of the sheep, for the strengthening of the sheep. It's all God. This is that quick Sunday school answer, right? You say God. And that's who it is. God is doing all of this. If you go back through, and I encourage you to do this at some time, in Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 36 as well. But look where God says, I will. A direct prophecy from God. I will bring them out. I will seek them. I will find them. I will heal them. I will feed them. I will, I will, I will. So you find here the great shepherd is doing exactly what the great shepherd does. Now, how much credit do the sheep get? If you look back at all the I wills, there's not a lot of credit given there to the sheep, all right? The credit is given, the glory is given, solo de gloria, to the one who's doing all the work. It is God. How many people seek after God? No one seeks after God, the Bible says, right? How are we sought? He comes to us. God seeks us out, finds us, bring, he brings healing to the sheep. Now, continue on. Look at Ezekiel 34. 17 through 24. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between the sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must, be, must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my sheep. They, know they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Wow. So here we have it. Again, you have God, the great shepherd, condemning the leaders of the shepherds of Israel, saying that they have trodden under their feet the food that they were supposed to feed the sheep. They have muddied the water that they were supposed to drink of. They've de they're not feeding, they're not watering. And you take this in light, of course, John chapter 10 of Jesus being the great shepherd. But also you see John's progression. If you go back to chapter 7, chapter 8, you have, or chapter 6 even, chapter 6, you have Jesus being uh, presenting himself as the bread of life, right? He is the great manna. We must feed of him. We must eat of him. You go into chapter 7 and chapter 8, you have Jesus as the one that we must drink of. So you see these types being fulfilled in Jesus Christ himself, that he is not only the king, but he is also the great shepherd. He is also the one that we eat of, also the one that we drink of. It is to him we go for all of our nourishment to this great shepherd. Now, uh, with this lack of any shepherds, God announces that he is going to shepherd his sheep through his servant, David. Now, David has been long gone. He's been dead for a long time, right? So how is David going to feed his sheep when he has been dead for many years? Obviously, it's not a direct reference to David or any kind of reincarnation or anything like that. Uh, but from 2 Samuel 7, 14, that great prophecy that from the line of David, there is going to be one that God raises up that will be an everlasting king, that will have an everlasting kingdom. And from that prophecy, we know that the Messiah is going to come through the lineage, through the line of David, and he will take on that. He will be the greater servant, David, right? He'll be the greater king, David, but he's not the exact person, obviously. So this prophesied everlasting king from the line of David would also be God's shepherd. And that's what we see happening here in John 9, here in John 10 as well, that he, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. And look back there at Ezekiel uh, 34. Look at verse 24, or verse 23. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. He shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them, 
I am the Lord, I have spoken. Even think of this in light of John chapter 9. At the end of John chapter 9, uh, the, the blind man has been sent out. And uh, then you have Jesus seeking out the blind man who's been cast out by the shepherds, driven out by horn, by, by angry aggression from them. He's no longer allowed in the synagogues, no longer allowed in the Jewish religion. Yet Jesus goes and finds him. And then you look at verse third John chapter 9, look at verse 38. And the blind man said, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And so here you have the Messiah, the shepherd that God has sent being worshiped. Uh, he will be the verse 24 of Ezekiel says, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. Here it is. Here you have you have all this playing in together. When you get to John chapter 10, you have the lost sheep. The injured sheep, the wounded sheep of the blind man born, 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 been born blind, sorry, tongue twister, uh, cast out, and yet the great shepherd goes and finds him. He nurtures him. He calls him. The blind man believes in him and sees him and worships him as Lord and as God. All this is tying in to this Ezekiel 34 prophecy. Now, uh, as we consider this, uh, we've seen many types as we've gone through the book of John that are fulfilled uh, in Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, obviously, you have prophecies that are fulfilled in the Messiah, messianic prophecies. We're looking at some of that today. All right. But also you have the types and the study of types, the typologies that find their fulfillment. You, they find their substance in Jesus Christ. So we found earlier there that the bridegroom type is actually fulfilled in Christ. Uh, you have many other types that are fulfilled. Obviously, the easiest one is when John the Baptist announces Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. So we see that sacrificial type fulfilled in this ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But you also have the king uh, type that is going to be fulfilled in this everlasting king. You also see, though, this great shepherd that God is going to send is going to be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So this is prophetic, but it's also a type that is fulfilled uh, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, you don't want to miss, I don't think you want to miss this either. As, as we consider the shepherd, how is he going to feed? How is he going to nourish? How is he going to bring his own to himself? How is he going to preserve his flock? I've, I think all this is tied in to what the, he is going to do with the Holy Spirit. So look over at Ezekiel 36. And all this just continues down. We don't have time to go through in all the details of 34, 35. But in Ezekiel 36, you get the announcement of the new covenant that God is going to make. And this new covenant is beautiful in that you see uh, how this is going to happen. Uh, how is Jesus going to feed his flock? How is he going to preserve his flock? We find out that there is a new covenant that is unlike the old covenant. It is different. And it's very, very personal. Look at this. Look at verse 26 through 29. Again, you see the I wills here. God, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. So this is the beauty of this new shepherding work that God is going to do. It's all connected to the Messiah, to the coming shepherd, who's going to truly shepherd his flock in a new covenant that he is making, and every one of his sheep, this is going to be the case. Every one of the true sheep of God will have a new spirit within them, will have a new heart within them. The old stony heart will be removed. A heart of flesh that beats for God will be put in place. A whole new conscience, you might say, will be implanted there that desires and longs to obey God. Whereas previously that we only desired to sin and get as much sin as we could in, now it's completely rearranged, and we will be God's possession. We will be in God's true flock. And so all uncleanliness, forgive, look at verse 29, 
I will deliver you from all uncleanliness. Look at verse 28. Uh, uh, you shall be my people. So within this, we see that these people have been born again. They've been regenerated. God's Holy Spirit remains in them. They are God's possession. There is no way they're going to be, ever become not God's possession. All right? So you have this, this all tying in, this, these several chapters in Ezekiel where God is going to send the shepherd because there is no shepherd. They're abusing the flock. This true shepherd is going to come and they're going to be under the one shepherd. But also they're going to, we're going to see that there's going to be this supernatural work that is being accomplished through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that this shepherd is going to nurture and care for and preserve his flock. Uh, look over at, uh, I think we're going to stop there in Ezekiel, but look over at Jeremiah chapter 31. It's hard to, to teach on Ezekiel 36, 26 through 29 without mentioning Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. Because both of these have to do with the new covenant that is made in Jesus Christ. We took the Lord's Supper last week and uh, went over the words where Jesus introduces the new covenant. He is the new covenant maker. He is the new covenant keeper. It is made in his blood. So all this is happening uh, right at this time as Ezekiel has prophesied the shepherds are bad. He's going to raise up his one true shepherd that is also going to be God. So this shepherd is going to be God in the flesh. He is going to make a new covenant in conjunction with this. Verse uh, 33 of Jeremiah 31. For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And I always like to use that in conjunction with Ezekiel 36, because again, you see that every person that is in this new covenant has forgiveness of sins. Their sins have been forgiven. He will remember their sins no more. You have that internal working of the Holy Spirit, of what God is doing, and planting uh, his, the God's, uh, the new heart is there. The law is within them, written on their hearts. Now we love to obey God. We love to honor God. Uh, Jesus says you'll know them by the way they love one another, so that we love one another now, that we have new hearts now. Instead of being selfish and narcissistic, now we love others and we love God. And all this is a great work of the great shepherd who is caring and nurturing for our souls via the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, keep all those things in mind. Now let's turn to John chapter 10. All right. Again, this John chapter 10 is beautiful in and of itself. But when you see these connections to the Old Testament, it's just it just blows up. It's like, wow, this is huge. This is not just out of the blue, Jesus saying, uh, talking about sheep and talking about shepherding. This is a common theme that runs through the Old Testament and a common theme that there are false shepherds that claim to be shepherds and that God is the ultimate shepherd in this th Ezekiel 34, that he is going to send his one true shepherd. Um, look at verse 1. Let's go back there. In John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now here, it appears that the shepherds are compared to thieves and robbers who are after the sheep purely for selfish gain. They're not trying to feed them, not trying to nurture them, not trying to heal them, but they're breaking in another way. Uh, in other words, why, words they're not authorized by uh, the sheep owner, by God, to care for the sheep. And they're, they're trying to steal them away. Uh, the true shepherd has full authority to enter in through the gatekeeper. So again, you see all this exclusiveness of Jesus Christ. He has been sent by God. He has been authorized by God to care for, to nurture, to call his sheep to himself. He has full authority to go into the gate. Because think about this. Not only was the blind man cast out, but the shepherds were trying to kill the true shepherd. They hated Jesus Christ. 
They wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him multiple times. They'll finally get their wish and kill him, but they hate him. So he has been cast out as well. But yet the one they cast out is the only one who has true authority to access the sheep. Now, you also see in this passage, uh, look at verse 3, chapter 10. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, this is fascinating because it, here we see a very intimate, personal calling of God himself to the sheep. And we see an example of that exemplified over there in John chapter 9 with the man born blind. They cast him out. Jesus goes to him, seeks him out, conversates with him. The man believes in him as he is called and acknowledges that Jesus is Lord and God and worships him, right? So we see this intimate call. The man's been cast out, but yet Jesus goes to him. Um, now with this, though, we can also see that those who are not sheep, like the Pharisees, the Pharisees witnessed everything. The man who was born blind, now seeing. They had the neighbors come in who knew the man, and yet they would not believe them. They called in the parents to say, is this, has this man truly been born blind? And they agree that he had been, yet they still do not believe him. They ask him who healed him. They, the man says, Jesus. And yet they tell him, do not give any glory to Jesus, only to God, right? And then they claim that Jesus is a sinner. But so you see the, the true sheep acknowledging who Jesus is. Like he is not just a man. He must be a prophet. No, he is a righteous man. No, God listens to him. In fact, you know what? He is Lord. He is the Son of Man. He is God. I want to worship him. And at the end of chapter 9, what do you have the Pharisees doing? Getting harder and harder and harder. And to the, to the fact, even like with Lazarus, they want to kill Lazarus after Jesus has risen him from the dead. Why? Because him being alive just speaks volumes of who Jesus is. So still, instead of seeing Jesus as the Messiah, they're so blind, they'd rather kill kill Lazarus here they don't want this blind man in their synagogues telling anyone what they what he's has happened to him so they want him removed so you see the true sheep hearing the voice of Jesus coming to Jesus and seeing him rightly the light of the world all right here you see those who are not sheep these supposed shepherds hating Jesus more and more now there's also uh, lots of personal application with this passage here in verse 3 as well if you have come to see the light of Christ uh, and you've seen him rightly as the blind man did, then you too have been personally called by the shepherd. And this is this is amazing to think on, even though Jesus personally is not present in bodily, physically form here, uh, has not called you in that capacity as the blind man uh, was called that day. Yet you have been called by the great shepherd. The one who created the universe, who put everything into place, who hung the stars, hung the sun, and put the earth in place and spun it around, who has created you, has called you. If you have seen Christ and seen him as the blind man did, as truly man, truly God, and are, have worshipped him, this is very revealing that you are not uh, like the false shepherds. You are not a false sheep, that you are a right sheep who sees him who have been called to him, and you have come to him. Now, this is something that, uh, that is fascinating to think on. And you may be able to recall at some point in your life where something like that happened. I remember I was, I was a young man in the town. I just came from visiting my mother, and I'd gone to church all my life and believed myself to be a sheep, believed myself to be a Christian. But yet I remember one day sitting out there listening to the sermon and realizing that I was not saved. I was not a Christian I was depending on what I could do to get to heaven and not resting in the one who says, I will, I will, I will, and not surrendering to that and acknowledging that it's all of God. And I saw my sin. I saw Jesus as the Savior of my soul. And that day, I remember going home, went back to my room, and there I was just distraught and, and crying. My mom came back and said, what's wrong? And it was like, I am a sinner, <laughs> and, and I need a Savior. And it was just, it was such a... A, a, a pressingness on my soul and a heaviness on my soul that day. And, uh, and I was saved that day in my room. 
now in the church I was, came from, I wasn't truly saved until I went forward in the church, you know. But uh, <laughs> I had to do that the next week. But, but you know my point. It was right there, though, that, that supernatural call of God uh, was happening, happening right there. And it was uh, intimate. It was, it, was, it, was, it was one-on-one, God drawing me to himself. The great shepherd of my soul was calling me to himself. And some of you can recall something like that. Not that you have to have that exact experience. I never want to say that. But if you can today rightly say, I see Jesus as Lord. I see Jesus as God and man. I worship him. Then that is a good sign that the light of the world has come to you, has drawn you to him. You see him rightly. You have a new heart and you believe in him for your salvation. And that is a beautiful thing. That is a a personal thing. Uh, thing that has happened it's supernatural and that god has reached you personally just as he did this blind man uh so there is there that we read this story oh that's a wonderful thing to see jesus to bow down his feet to to answer that call right but you have done this as well the i will has given you a new heart god himself he's given you a new desire and you have come to him uh one thing we I, i put in my notes here is you know you have been called by christ if you came to Christ, have you come to Christ? Uh, because those who are called do come to Christ. Uh, look at verse 4 in John chapter 10. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Uh, and, and as we stop right there just a moment, the shepherding analogy is often missed on those who do not know the ways of shepherds. And when we look around today, we don't see many shepherds around. So some of these things we kind of have to go back and study a little bit, right? Uh, but the, the sheep were trained to the voice of the shepherd. There's all kinds of fun little stories and fun little things written on this about different shepherds uh, calling sheep. And you could actually have them mixed together. Uh, but the different shepherds could make their signal, their call with their mouth, and all the sheep that belong to that shepherd that he's cared for that he's nurtured, come to him when they are called. Other shepherds could do the same thing. And within just seconds, the shepherds can, can pull the sheep out that belong to them, uh, not with a lot of work. They just come to the call, all right? So th- there's a lot of that going on here, that the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, all right? Uh, and they come to him when they are called. Uh, we covered this quite a bit over in John chapter 6. Oftentimes, uh, we call this in theology the irresistible call of God. If you're a fan of that acronym TULIP, right, uh, this would be that I at the end, that irresistible call of God, where it's we come, why? Because we are called. Uh, that's, how we, that's when we come. If you think back to like Ephesians chapter 2, we were objects of his wrath. We were following Satan. We were following the sons of disobedience. We were doing whatever our passions and desires wanted to do. But then God makes us alive. And we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not of works, not that, so we may not boast. And all this is, is from God. So this irresistible call uh, is what we're talking about here. Uh, he calls us to him and we come to him. Uh, it is because on the day of your salvation, your unwillingness is changed to willingness by God. We come to him when we are called to him because we have been born again by him. And so this is how you know that you have come to Christ is because you do come to Christ. And God has made you willing on the day of your salvation. He has given you a new heart. And along with that heart, he gives faith. He gives repentance. You see Jesus rightly. You see your sin rightly. And you come to him. Several passages we looked at. We'll just cover a couple of them quickly in John chapter 6 as we looked at this call of God. Uh, look at, look, actually go, go back to Romans chapter 8, 28 through 30. It's a good one as well. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Then we'll go back to John 6. But look at Romans 8, 28 through 30. And here uh, Paul says, And we know that for those whom God, whom love God, all things work together for good of those who are called. Uh, you might emphasize that, underline that, called according to his purpose. So these are those who have been called by God, called by the great shepherd. 
uh, it goes right back into John chapter 10, where he, the sheep hear his voice and they come. He is called to them. Look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So here you have the exact same group of people who are receiving all of this. Uh, all those who are called are also going to be justified, are also going to be glorified. All those whom he has predestined are going to be called. And you have this, what we often call in theology, is this golden chain of salvation. as a golden chain because it speaks of the deity. It speaks of the links of the chain. And a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. But when God is in charge of every single link of that salvation, this chain is established. This chain is secure. This chain is firm, and it cannot be broken because God is the one. He is the great I am who is doing the I will, acting out on all of these steps for us. So all those who are predestined are going to be glorified. All those who are called are going to be glorified. All those who are justified are going to be glorified. And what do you have here? You see, if you take it back to Ezekiel 36, that Jeremiah passage as well, you, we are the possession of God. His sheep come to his voice when they are called. All right, so keep that passage in mind as you consider this calling of Jesus. Also look over at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, look at verse 44. <clears throat> there's, there's several here that speak of a similar truth, uh, but we're just going to look at a couple of them. John 6, 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And not that it is exact, but you can, you can virtually put the word calls him right there, okay? And I will raise him up on the last day. So here we have the, that total depravity of man, that total inability of man. No one can come to the Father in and of themselves. There is a qualifier. What is that qualifier? Uh, God calls them. So we find that no one is seeking after God, uh, but yet God is coming after them, and that God calls them. And how many of those that God calls to himself or draws to himself are going to be glorified, are going to be raised up on the last day? And we looked at this in John chapter 6, and the answer is all. So if you look at that verse again, no one can. We don't have the ability to come to God in and of ourselves unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So all those that the Father draws are also those who are going to be justified, also those who are going to be glorified. So you have this one body that is given to the Son and the Son is going, they're going to be drawn to him and called to him and he is going to raise them up on the last day. This is that ultimate shepherding, okay? We come to that shepherd. The shepherd cares for us, nurtures us, preserves us in this life and the afterlife, preserves our salvation all the way through. Uh, how many of those he draws to himself will be successfully raised up? It's all. All of the true sheep of God come to the true shepherd, and not one will be lost. That's a beautiful thing to think about. How many of those that he draws will not come? Uh, they all will. There's zero that are not going to come. We come because we're sheep. We're come because we're made willing on the day of our salvation where God does that supernatural work upon our heart that we now love God. We desire to obey him and we come to him. Uh, can people come to Christ on their own without being called? Look at John 6, 65, just a few verses down from uh, what we looked at in 44. Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. What does this mean? Well, this ties right back into that Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 36. Who was getting the glory for doing all of that work upon the sheep? Not the sheep. Uh, it was God. It was all I will, I will, I will, repeated, 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 right? So that God gets all the glory for our salvation. Our shepherd calls us to himself. We come to him, remain with him, and are preserved by him, and are given eternal life by him. So what should we do? We worship him, just like the blind man did. We see him for who he, what he did. Did the, blind man, uh, did the blind man do anything that day in and of himself? No, he just he sees Jesus for who he truly is, right? 
but that has been a supernatural work upon his heart. Uh, look at verse 6, John chapter 10, verse 6. Let's carry on. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So, and again, you see the blindness in them, right? Uh, the figure of speech that he is using, this metaphor, this analogy, this comparison. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, you have Ezekiel 34. God is going to send his true shepherd, uh, the, like his servant David, to nurture his flock. Uh, they should be picking up on what Jesus is laying down, but they do not. They remain blind. Look at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find and I and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So here Jesus is still on the shepherding comparison, but now he's, he's changed the role, which is common. It, not only is he the great shepherd, but he is also the door to the sheep pen so that there is, he is the one. He is the only access point. There is no other way. It is only through Jesus. So what is it speaking of? It's speaking, speaking of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. It's like John 14, 6 would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through what? Through me, through Jesus Christ. So that he, he uses that ego eime statement here in Greek, coming from uh, Exodus chapter 3, uh, that he is I am, that the name given to God is I am, he is God, the door. There is no other door. He is exclusively the way to heaven. So as we look back at this passage in summary, chapter 10 is teaching us, is teaching and is closely connected to, to, to John chapter 9 that the Pharisees have listened to the man born blind, refused to believe that Jesus healed him, proclaimed he was, to, he was born in sin, cast him out, they've rejected Christ, and they uh, supposedly reject him from access to God as the, they've driven the sheep away with their horns. Yet, the good shepherd sees this, and what does he do? He finds him, he goes to him, he nurtures him, he heals him, and the blind man comes when he is called and worships him truly. So what do we do with this passage today? Uh, well, we see the beauty of prophecy and types fulfilled in Christ and fulfilled through the great shepherd. And we also see the, the beauty of us being saved as well, that if you have been called to God, if you have come to God, this is a supernatural work of God. You have come to him because you have been called to him. If you see him as Lord, if you see him as God, you see and trust in him for your salvation, this is extremely revealing, right? That your eyes have been opened, like the blind man, except your spiritual eyes, and you see Jesus correctly. What should our response be? That we don't pat ourselves on the back. We worship him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for doing what we cannot do in and of ourselves. We have no ability to save ourselves. There's not enough good we could do. There's not enough bad that we could stop doing so that we could be saved. Every single sin deserves the wrath and curse uh, from you. It deserves judgment. And we thank you, God that there is, you have given us clear direction that there is only one way to heaven, that there is only one true shepherd that leads us to heaven, and it is Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray now, uh, perhaps you're calling someone to yourself even this day. Lord, may they see Jesus rightly as who he truly is. May they rest in his work for salvation. May they rest in the great I will of the great I am. And may they not try to do anything in and of themselves. But, sir, but just come and see that indeed Jesus is the light of the world. Lord, open their eyes to see, open their hearts, give them new hearts, Lord. But Lord, we pray for us who are saved today, Lord, that we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the worship for the great salvation that you have accomplished. Help us today and when uh, times and days and, and moments come into our life where we feel completely in chaos sometimes, help us to rest knowing that even in the light of our tribulations or, perse or persecutions or trials or sufferings, whatever comes our way, 
Help us to go to the great shepherd and know that all things happen according to, for the good of those who've come to you, Lord, and rest in that because we love you. We've come to you, and we know that you care for us. Help us to rest in that truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.